Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. This is going to be another lecture in our Intro to Critical Theory series here in the beginning months of 2024. Uh, we have just been reading Lenin, um, State and Revolution. Before Lenin, we read Carl Schmitt, so I gave a, a more extreme left, more extreme right um, version um, of of uh, perspectives or versions of perspective, I, I suppose, um, that situate the critical theorists. Um, as we know, the critical theorists emerge, um, at least in the Frankfurt variety, um, from the 1922 um, uh, formation of the Institute for Social Research, um, uh, funded um, by, in large part, by by a, a a Jewish thinker. We will we will come back to that, or a Jewish philanthropist, anyway. Um, definitely set up as an institute to be a bridge between um, the traditional academy and kind of new form of thought that will become uh, this description of critical theory or the critical tradition. And and this is what uh, Herbert Marcuse in an earlier lecture and reading that we had um, was distinguishing between traditional theory and critical theory. We're going to see a little bit of that um, with Horkheimer here. Of course, the Frankfurt School thinkers um, uh, have to leave Germany um, and they have to, uh, they, they, um, uh, move their funds out of Germany. Um, they first try to go to Switzerland and then they en end up having to come to the United States. Um, they're fleeing Nazi Germany because they are largely Jewish thinkers. Um, and uh, um, uh, they, they are literally running for their lives. And I think that that's something that's really important to keep in mind as we're um, thinking about this moment, um, I will have more to say about the kind of the formation of in the 1920s here, but I've been really trying to set up more of the cultural milieu in these earlier lectures uh, in our course so that we can really understand what's at stake, I think, for the critical theorists. And 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 uh, I did just say it's their lives, of course, and, and it's their lives as thinkers and as intellectuals, right? Um, so... Um, they come, most of them come to the United States in the early 1930s. Um, by 34, they are here. Um, the essay that we're going to be addressing today is from 1937, about the same year as the Marcuse essay that we looked at um, when we opened the course. Uh, after this lecture, I will return to the, the, the moment where Hitler has taken um, over in, the, in um, around 1933, 1934. Um, and we will look at Emmanuel Levinas, who is not a critical theorist. Again, um, uh, like many of the the earlier thinkers that we've been looking at in this course, um, but by looking at other contemporary perspectives, again, as those for those of us who are interested in in critical theory, we understand what critical theory is trying to do. This lecture um, contextualized reading today is it's um, going to walk through. And, and really delineate, I think, for those of us who are interested, who who are interested in what it means to be and do critical theory. I think that that Horkheimer's uh, uh, text for today really, 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 really establishes it. Also, if you're like a lot of my university students, you're reading these earlier materials and you're probably finding it, if you're looking at the PDFs from the CCC theory website, you're, they're hard to decipher. This is difficult stuff to read. That's why I have these contextualized readings. They are more about us trying to understand the readings than me giving you, you know, a grand sort of, uh, um, uh, sort of politicized version of 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 where I think things ought to be. Of course, I'm a human. Of course, I have dispositions that are political. Um, uh, and um, but my my role here in this course as as a professor is to um, more illuminate uh, for people what what these thinkers have said how they've thought about things that then become reformulated in the later 20th century, as we will look at later on in the course. So I kind of sometimes jump to towards the future and we will jump pretty quickly 
um, after Levinas up to uh, um, Wendy Brown, who's a contemporary thinker, and Glenn Sean Coulthard, who's a contemporary indigenous thinker. So we will get to the the, the current moment and then and then pop back in between. Uh, um, but my my main goal here um, is to just get us to understand what the the texts are saying, and then um, look at the implications from there. So let's dig in today to um, uh, Horkheimer, excuse me, I almost said Herbert Marcuse. We'll come back to him too. And his essay, Traditional and Critical Theory. Uh, unlike my last lecture on the second part of Lenin, I have this one written out to keep myself on track and I can provide it on the um, the theory, the CCC theory website as, as well, or on the Patreon page. I think that's, a, that's where I'm able to upload this stuff. So if you support us on Patreon, you can have access to the texts. I may, as always, have to fix little typos and things along the way as I read out loud, but let's begin. <clears throat> Okay. Max Horkheimer opens the 1937 text, Traditional and Cr Critical Theory, um, with several conventional definitions for theory as it relates to the sciences. The conventional definitions are for his time period, right? Um, for how the sciences are thought of. Uh, he notes that such definitions tend to favor mathematics and deductive logic. He says, quote, the basic requirement which any theoretical system must satisfy is that of that all the parts should intermesh thoroughly and without friction. Harmony, which includes lack of contradictions and the absence of superfluous, purely dogmatic elements which have no influence on the observable phenomena, are necessary conditions, according to um, uh, Herman Vail. Um, so he's citing Vail's text there. End quote. Human sciences, or what American students today might know better as the humanities, have up to Horkheimer's time attempted to follow the natural sciences. And in, you know, in a longer history, I think, I mean, the, of course, the natural sciences emerge from the human sciences in, in the Renaissance, if, we're, if we want to, that's another way of maybe looking at it. Um, where philosophy isn't a separate discipline from, you know, um, uh, chemistry or something like that, for, especially for someone like Isaac Newton, right? Uh, the alchemist <laughs> is the philosopher. Uh, so, um, but human scientists or what American students might better know as the humanities have up to Horkheimer's time attempted to follow the natural sciences. This has particularly been the case in Anglo-Saxon universities um, relating to a, quote, assiduous collecting of facts in all disciplines dealing with social life, the gathering of great masses of detail in connection with problems, end quote. Horkheimer concludes then um, that all of this adds up to a pattern which is outwardly much like the rest of life in a society dominated by industrial production techniques. Sociology up to this point has followed the same approach of determining knowledge. The sciences have, in the late 19th century, developed all of these new disciplines, anthropology, psychology, sociology, what we now call the soft sciences, maybe. And um, with the accumulation of great amounts of knowledge, um, uh, knowledge itself has become abstract. Knowledge has become instrumentalized. Um, and too big for one any one discipline to explain the world, right? This is how, another way of how we might think of Nietzsche's famous claim of the death of God or the the, the an initiation of of a, a, a kind of nihilism um, in the late nineteenth century, right? So this is where this is the kind of earlier era before the critical theorists are writing and coming into their own situation. They're trying to take up the idea of what knowledge means in the 1920s with this whole new kind of panorama of disciplines that we have in the university. Most of the new sciences have tried to maintain 
a kind of access to um, making some sort of truth claim about the world, which is what 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 philosophy sort of comes from. Um, and as they have, uh, as thought has sort of emerged more and more for the critical theorists at this particular moment in time, um, uh, um, following scientific method, um, uh, you know, even if we're doing something like psychology, like Freud, right? Like Freud is drawing on humanity. So he's drawing on myth to, to deal with the Oedipal complex because he can't find yet in the brain where the mechanism is that he uses the metaphor of the Oedipal complex to try to describe, right? But he really thinks that he's we're going to find some sort of like machinery in the human brain in order to do that, right? Um, so even someone like Freud is trying to set up something that he thinks of as a science. Whether he's successful or not is not relevant to this discussion, right? Um, but that's that's what uh, um, Horkheimer is saying here is that is that people keep trying to fit our new knowledge into the paradigm of um, science and the sciences as it is formed since the Enlightenment um, in this kind of methodology by which we externalize an experiment you have hypothesis experiment conclusion right um where we verify our truth claims about reality in the externalized or the posited um uh, experimentation process by which we can repeat the same process and get the same results scientific method modern scientific method right um, he turns at this point to, um, in the essay, to Max Weber um, and to Weber's account of history. According to this Weber, who's a sociologist, of course, right, and to his line of thinking, if we think, link the outbreak of a war to a certain statement's, statesman's policies or a certain causal nexus of historical facts, the implication is that had such a policy or a statesman never existed, things would necessarily be different. If we construct a sequence of conditions, a predictable result must follow so long as we have the correct facts. When applied to history, this traditional theory, it becomes elaborated, right? So it makes sense. Like, like I mean, I think that, yes, the historians try to get the facts right. And like, we try, when we're looking back, we try to reconstruct events. Um, this is forensic rhetoric and Aristotle's um, uh, line of thinking. We're trying to piece together this past situation. Um, but if we're thinking scientifically, we're like looking at cause and effect and cause and effect over and over again, right? So we want our facts to sort of add up to the causes and the effects, even though we're working as historians in another way, we're working backwards, right? We're working from an effect and then we're attributing different kinds of causes to it, right? Um, uh, which can make doing history maybe a little bit different than doing other forms of science. Uh, so um, when applied to history, this traditional theory is elaborated. We can add in the physical manipulation of nature or the economic conditions to the same mode of fact gathering and analysis. So maybe it's not just what a statesman said. Maybe it's the economic conditions at the time. Maybe it's the climactic conditions of the time, right? And we do this in history still now. You know, we know that there was a warming period in the late medieval or early modern period um, throughout Europe that allowed for farming conditions to change. And those farming conditions allowed a great growth in population. They also pacified the seas and they made it easier to navigate. Um, so there are other ways that we might explain historical processes um, as, as well, if we're thinking kind of uh, along these lines. Um, so in Horkheimer here, I'm going to say that we can hear echoes of Marx in what follows. Um, we get we also get a clear description of the term fundamental to critical theory, um, which is reification, right? This is like, like a loaded term for us as critical theorists. Um, it's an, an important concept. But what I want you to hear in this passage I'm about to quote here um, is uh, some correspondences that you might see in Marx's manifesto of the Communist Party, which we read a few weeks ago. So Horkheimer says, quote, the technological advances of the bourgeois period are inseparably linked to this function 
of the pursuit of science. On the one hand, it made the facts fruitful for the kind of scientific knowledge that would have practical implication or application in the circumstances. And on the other, it made possible the application of knowledge already possessed. Beyond doubt, such work is a moment in the continuous transformation and the development of the natural foundations of society. But the conception of theory was absolutized as though it were grounded in the inner nature of knowledge as such or justified in some other ahistorical way. And thus it became reified, a reified ideological category. This is a really loaded little passage here, but what he's doing, and this is where we can see Marx and Horkheimer's thinking here, is that like the development of knowledge in Western Europe, as he's giving an account here, um, starts out scientifically. It starts just to, to, to piece together this, this picture based on causes and effects. Um, but then what also happens there is that it, becomes internalized into the thought systems of of um, philosophers like Rene Descartes, like Immanuel Kant, like George Berkeley, where we're talking about like our ability to perceive knowledge, our epistemological ideas, how how what is the study of the nature of knowledge and perception. And that internalized concept of rationality is what becomes absolutized here. Right. So we're no longer talking about actual external conditions. We're just piecing together these kinds of facts into a constellation of uh, different little nodes that then form a gestalt of um, our concept of history. Right. And then we take that concept of history and we say that is what actual externalized history is. And then we move about in our lives as if that construction of history were the were the right thing. Um, and so the ideological category then has an, a real impact in the world, right? If we think that history is developing in a certain way, and like Immanuel Kant thought that non-white people were just going to naturally die off because they were naturally inferior, then uh, there doesn't need to be for somebody in the Kantian persuasion um, uh, any kind of like real moral regard for non-white races, for example, because they are going to naturally go the way of the dodo bird, according to his thinking, right? If you have that kind of thinking, then of course, that's a, there are real effects for non-Euro-Christian or non-white folks in the world, right? Um, who have completely, of course, been miscategorized and misthought. Um, by uh, um, uh, Western philosophers during this time. Um, uh, so we've definitely, going on with my my written lecture here, we've definitely encountered such kind of thinking in previous writers we've read so far. But Horkheimer, and, and I do appreciate Horkheimer for this, Horkheimer has a talent for synthesizing complex thoughts that we may have encountered in Feuerbach or Marx, and more implicitly in the scientism that drove Lenin's analysis and state and revolution in my previous lectures. So I want to suggest here in what follows that although Horkheimer's thinking here is clearly drawing on Marx, He's not exactly following Marx. He's not following Marx in the way that Lenin thinks he's following Marx for sure. So implicitly, if Marx were trying to develop a materialist economic account of history, he was essentially following, falling under from Horkheimer's perspective here. And I know this is kind of pushing Horkheimer here, but if we really kind of push Horkheimer's thinking, um, if, if Marx is only trying to develop a materialist economic account of history, he was perhaps falling under the sway of bourgeois scientism and positivism. Because, and what do I mean by that? What, what I mean is that when Marx and, and Engels set up their account of the history of class struggles as being this externalized thing that if, if we just like take ideology out of things and, and we can we just give a concrete analysis based on the positive facts of the competition for resources over time, um, then we can, from that, extrapolate a kind of futurity that Marx and Engels are going to call um, this shift towards um, the dictatorship of the proletariat, for example, and the eventual 
um, uh, founding of a communist society, right? That that um, that kind of conveniently packaged linear trajectory, <laughs> when I put it that way, kind of sounds like um, like Hegel, I and mean, we can hear Hegel behind it. Kind of sounds like Kant's theory of perpetual peace. Kind of sounds like a Euro Christian salvation narrative that's moving toward the kind of future time that will be idealistic, even though Marx, of course, uh, has this uh, allergy to religion, to put it mildly. Um, uh, there's a kind of linear trajectory there that I think if we really think about what Horkheimer is saying here, if we, we, if we were going to take a critical angle of Marx, we might say, you know, maybe it's not going to work that conveniently. Maybe Marx here is betraying his own sort of internalized um, uh, adherence to enlightenment, progressive thought, right? Of course, you know, that doesn't take away from the radicalism of what historical materialism is in relationship to the idealists or idealist philosophy. And maybe, I'm, as I mentioned this right now, my next lecture, I'm going to be dealing with a, a, a essay by Emmanuel Levinas, a Jewish ethical thinker from the early 1930s. And he's going to characterize Marxism along these kinds of lines that, that idealism kind of sets itself up one way and materialism sets itself as its opposite in a dialectical kind of negation to that. So it's really just a flipping of the script, but it doesn't change the entire frame of the situation. Um, and so, so on the one hand, Marx is very, um, challenging to um, the development of Western philosophy um, at this uh, on at the same time he is an extension of it right um, but we'll come back to that with Levinas I just want to point that out that I, I I think that the same that it's possible to have the same implicit critique of Marx going on um, in Horkheimer here as well um Ideology in the Marxian tradition is an obstruction to the process of material history produced in favor of the ruling class to justify its domination of all others. We saw this in Feuerbach's account of bourgeois society's treatment of religion. When ideology is taken as reality, it produces concrete conditions of domination. The transformation of ideology into concrete conditions is the process of reification super important concept for thinking of doing critical theory of the Frankfurt School. It's an important concept that they give us as thinkers. It's already in Marx and Feuerbach and the critical theorists give us a, a, a little bit more defined um, technique for, for noticing it. We are these days in the 21st century, perhaps more familiar with the idea of a, quote, social construct. Let's take, just to try and understand this in more contemporary terms, let's take race, for example. Big topic in our culture, in the U.S. culture especially. Current science tells us that there is no biological basis for race. Modern racism has been a social construction developed by Euro-Christians or white people and who in the U.S. frequently referred to themselves as Anglo-Saxons to justify their dominance over indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and the increasing need for imported slave labor from Africa. During the 19th century, all sorts of unfounded, quote, scientific claims were made by leading intellectuals concerning the superiority of Euro-Christian whites over others. Earlier than that, and this is why I use the term Euro-Christian, you're, you're reading Virginia law or you're reading New England law from the 1600s, they are not using the term white, they're using Christian and non-Christian, and that eventually becomes um, codified along the lines of white and non-white, and so whiteness becomes a legal category, it is not just a sociological category, um, uh, and later on, with pseudoscience of the 19th century, it becomes a kind of, quote, biological category, and then that gets inter interrupted, right? So the history of the concept of, of race goes through its own sorts of transformations, right? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, during the 19th century, there's all sorts of unfounded scientific claims that are happening. 
um, uh, with the concept of race. M major philosophers such as Locke, Hume, Kant, and Mill all brought into their own philosophy, no matter how secular or so-called liberal, remember that liberal self-congratulatory liberalism um, statement from my pro former professor, Victoria Kahn, um, from an earlier lecture, right? Yes, the, the tradition has been read as this kind of trajectory towards secularization, but if we really go back and read these thinkers um, from uh, a position that that is is trying to understand how religiosity might be at work in their thinking major philosophers such as Locke Hume Kant and Mill all brought into a conception brought bought all bought into excuse me a conception of euro-christian racial superiority that went well beyond skin color and was their characterization of so-called civilized society in quotes there in this conception, Euro-Christian society was the product of the, quote, white races, and its successful flourishing and domination was, quote, living proof of its superiority, just as the Christian religion was conceived as the ideological vehicle that brought civilization into being. Well, there is no tangible scientific or, quote, factual evidence for the basis of race, its ideological construction has had real world effects and continues to have real world effects um, that continue to reverberate today. This is one example of reification in the sense that critical theorists mean it. Cancel culture, which is a recent phenomenon, whether it's on the left um, or on the right. So if, uh, on the right, I mean, I think people will probably know what I mean by cancel culture on the left. Uh, like the Harvey Weinstein's, like 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 people who we don't really, maybe shouldn't be in positions of power, right? Like um, who have uh, abused their power um, due to their um, uh, gender dominance or their money influence, whatever that happens to be. They're the people that we don't really want to have around um, in certain positions of power. But cancel culture also works on the the right. So we can think of Ron DeSantis in Florida, for example, trying to cancel curricula attending to African-American studies or LGBTQIA issues or critical race theory, right? Which does, eventually we will get to talking about critical race theory, but it extends out of um, the earlier introduction to critical theory, right? So part of my agenda in this big course is to give my uh, audiences, especially in the United States, a more robust way of thinking about what critical theory is in general, including later on when we get to critical race theory, which has been bastardized and politicized in these like stupid conversations in, um, uh, um, in very, very status quo, um, liberal and conservative political discussions in the United States, um, where people throw the term around and they don't really know what critical race theory is, right? So, um, that's a much longer and, and bigger project for this course. Um, uh, I, here, I'm just wanting to point out how if we think about the concept of race and the way that it changes over time, that even though it's to a certain extent a socially imaginary or a socially constructed idea, um, the ways that that idea has been implemented has real concrete um, uh, results and consequences in the world. That's what the critical theorists mean by reification. Um, so cancel culture, whether on the right or the left, um, implies a kind of politics of uh, um, purity, right? And this is something that I want to sort of be attentive to as a critical thinker today is I wanna be sort of suspicious of the politics of purity wherever people are sort of forming it. Um, it's oftentimes framed as a moral purity or a value-laden kind of uh, purity, um, a return to conservative culture, a return to traditional values for some conservatives. But what that does um, is it masks a kind of zero-sum contestation for power. Um uh, and that, and of course, that happens in politics. It happens in university culture. It happens in our job cultures. Right now, it's a, it's a big um, uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, to say the least, um, in the United States. So, um, for me, I'm, I, I want to push against something like counter or sorry, like cancel culture. And I would rather deal with a thinker like Carl Schmitt, for example, whose politics I do not in any way um, subscribe to. Um, but 
uh, who must be taken seriously, if only to refute, right? Like, uh, it's just like, like, you know, the conventional version of this is like considering the opposition's point of view or something like that. But I think as critical theorists, we take this to a much more heightened level. Like we really have to um, consider what is being said by the people who might be politically on the entire different part of the spectrum from from where our values are rather than sort of retreating to our bubbles our information bubbles that are fed by our cookies feeds on our computers and our algorithms that try to push us into a more and more marketable marketized sort of uh, identity categories that can then be located and then we can have more and more information fed so it's really hard to do critical theory work right now i understand it and i understand that it can be irritating to, to you know it's like it's like you know, like irritating to have to read a nazi to understand like what the nazis are saying yeah like like uh um uh um, but if we want to understand claims about fascism or like whether they're being made by people on the right or the left today, we need to have this broader historical sense of what fascism really was back then and 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 to see how iterations of it might actually be recurring now, right? right? Um, or, or to see the longer history of something like race that precedes maybe the identity politics that is so rampant since maybe the late, late 80s and 90s, for example, in our culture, right? Um, to see that, 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 that the longer contours of race and racism continues to have its effects outside of the ways that we might be competing against each other in our, our identity categories um, for uh, our little slice of the economic pie in the system that we're in. <laughs> um, uh, so you might you might look at my my previous lecture. Where I, where I was kind of going into some of that stuff. Uh, so that's a little foray into contemporary times. Let's go back into Horkheimer now. So returning to Horkheimer in this essay, he follows Marx in the con argument that bourgeois rationality was initially a good thing and liberate and a liberating thing, but that it became absolutized in scientific thought and began people began to take it for the essence of how the mind works implicitly then people who were more quote scientifically capable through sophisticated means of measurement developed by european society were seen as quote naturally superior to others in terms of this course i invite my students to reflect back on my own account of German Romantic philosophy from maybe lectures two and three years in there as attempting to account for something that the Enlightenment had left out. In Hegel, this was, quote, spirit or mind. In Marx, following Feuerbach, um, he sought a more tangible account of this through the history of class struggle. But there was already something in social analysis that was accounting for a way of life irreducible to scientism and instrumental reason, right? So this is another way, like the, earlier I was, I was kind of critiquing Marx, but, I, but there's another way to read Marx it, as adhering to a Germanic tradition, even in his materialism, to try to account for something that um, is irreducible to something like instrumental reason. And sometimes we attribute this in, in Marxist studies to the earlier or romantic Marx that like at the end of the day, if the idea is to change, um, is not to just account for society like the philosophers of Marxist times did, but to change it, the, the, the impulse or the motivation to change it is to change for more equitable conditions for the masses, right? So there's a humanitarian impulse going on in Marx, and Marx's analysis is trying to account for that humanity, that piece of humanity that has been left out of the bourgeois rationalist, the bourgeois capitalist kind of system, right? So he's still trying to account for something that is that is left out of the picture, right? Even in idealism. So that core of German philosophy is persistent, whether we're talking about Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, Weber, Schmidt, or the critical theorists that we're reading. Um, uh, and and, and it, it's, it's consistent. And, and, and um, the more that we can see it, because my students in America, you know, in the United States anyway, today, you know, I think, you know, they're complaining about sometimes like, oh, 
Like, why can't they use simpler language? Um, why are they just trying to sound smart? I don't think any of these people are writing in this particular way because they're just trying to sound smart or smarter than other people. I think that they're deep thinkers that are trying to figure something out. And they're also working within a long tradition of German philosophy. And that lends itself to having discourse presented in a particular way. And if you're not familiar with that, then it looks obscure to you. It's hard to understand. It's not because they're being assholes. It's because you have not been initiated into this thing. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so I, we used to say, I mean, when I was coming up in graduate school, like, like, you know, the tendency, like, one of the exercises is to maybe humble yourself to the text. It's not humbling yourself to the text because we need to worship white European or Euro Christian men or something like that. It's humbling ourselves to the text to try and be generous as readers to say, like, somebody else is trying to think through something here. They're thinking through it from their own conditions, from their own cultural situation. How can I, as a reader, have the capacity to try and understand what those conditions, um, historical, cultural, perhaps linguistic, if we're reading it in translation, how does all of that sort of mesh? How do I have the flexibility as a reader and a thinker not to try and pinpoint from the beginning, like, like, oh, I've got my number on Marx. Like, that's what he is. He's the leftist guy, communism, blah, blah, blah. Like, 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 uh, get out of it. We need to get rid of that. Like, like, we, we're not reading from our politicized identity categories. We're trying to understand how thought works and how previous thinkers have thought and the conditions in which their thought developed, not just their own geniuses as individuals, but their own social surroundings and their milieu, right? This is something that I think that critical theory gives us as readers. Um, it's not about being elitist, um, although it can feel that way, like, because we're just learning new things, right? You know, you try and pick up a new book that, about a subject matter that you've never learned before, you know, it will happen. You will probably fall asleep pretty quickly because your brain is working really, really hard to forge the neural pathways that don't exist yet to try and understand it. But it is not because people are being elitist. It is not because these thinkers are only men because you get to Lucia Rigore or you Elaine Sixu or Judith Butler or even Wendy Brown more recently. <laughs> There is no way that 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 the language is um, uh, uh, is in some way essentialized in terms of some particular kind of gender. It's just people are doing really really rigorous thinking, and they're trying to be as clear as possible. And we need to be as flexible as we can when we're trying to understand their texts. Um, we've also grown up in a culture where everything is marketed and packaged for us for easy consumption. These people are not writing that way. That's not how the literacy works at this particular moment in time. So we have been conditioned to not be thoughtful and generous and open to the ways that something that might seem strange or foreign to us occurs, right? Because for us, strangeness is like a new Netflix documentary, right? <laughs> or... Um, oh, here's something new in my cookies feed or something like somebody posted this on Instagram. That's not really what we're talking about with being curious and being critical um, or being open and open-minded. It's not just like, and it's not just looking at the opposite of yourself, right? As we'll see with Levy Knots later on. Okay, so my polemics aside, let's return to the, this discussion here. There's a core of German philosophy that's present in these thinkers. It's foreign to my United States students, of course. Um, Marxism critiqued the humanism of the Enlightenment. The idea that uh, individual rational being individual um, uh, uh, is the, exemplifies the culmination of humanity, right? The rational human being who's, who's embraced science, who's given up the dogma of religion, however you want to see it, that... Marxism critiqued this kind of humanism of the Enlightenment 
as the development of bourgeois ideology. And yet, of course, as he said in the thesis on Feuerbach, the point is not merely to critique society, but to change it for the betterment of the working classes and a more egalitarian distribution of material goods. Sometimes scholars have referred to this aspect of Marx as a, quote, romantic element, evident especially in his earlier writings. His later writings became more, quote, scientific as he attempted to a robust analysis of capitalism. Returning to Horkheimer's account, if rationalism became absolute, our question then becomes for right now is like, what did scientific instrumentally rational rationalist thought leave out? Right? Again, I want to characterize this as, 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 as one of the perhaps good things that, that comes out of a much longer tradition of German philosophy. They're trying to account for something that's that has been left out. Um, if our answer is merely to, to what has been left out, if, if our answer is a merely merely a vague account of human life or spirit, we have not escaped the ideological conditions in Hegel um, from a Marxian perspective here, right? Um, uh, we've not escaped the ideological conditions in Hegel and Feuerbach or the religious sentimentalist. If our attachment is to just individual flourishing, um, we have implicitly remained bourgeois and anti-democratic in terms of the distribution of material goods. Because under bourgeois capitalism, surely some people flourish, some people do really well. It just happens to be a minority of people who continue to consolidate their wealth um, and perpetuate the domination of most of the rest of the people in society. If our attachment is so, if our attachment is to flourishing, we have implicitly re remained bourgeois and anti-democratic. Um, Schmidt attacked the neo Aristotelian and neo Kantian philosophies of his moment for their attachment to scientific and legal positivism, but he made no claim to defend individual liberty. Far from it, for Schmidt as opposed to Marx here, right? Um, for Schmidt, every liberty and every law is subject to the sovereign decision, which includes the nullification of every liberty and every law. Um, so I just did Marx, the liberals, Schmidt there, right? Horkheimer takes a radically different position than Schmidt, unsurprisingly, <laughs> one that cannot be accounted for by simply saying that he and all of those Frankfurt School critical theorists are, are Marxists. They're, you're a Marxist. So that's all. That's all we can say. We can point out what you are. You're a Marxist and be done because we don't have to listen to you anymore, right? That's current day cancel culture kind of stuff that I've been crit critiquing earlier here. Um, no, I, I want to say that we, if we the fruitfulness of returning to Horkheimer and the Frankfurt School for us in this course um, is that he's going to give us a nuanced position for, for thinking about this stuff. Um, so remember that Schmidt, the conservative right-wing guy, had no love for sociology, and note that both Schmidt and Horkheimer have worked, have invoked Max Weber above, which attests to the influence of Weber's thought at the time and why current critical theorists such as Wendy Brown and Samuel Moyne have both returned to Weber to understand current 2024 nihilistic conditions. Um, so Wendy Brown, we will read her in a few weeks, but if we want to understand her stuff right now and why she's returned to a thinker like Max Weber, when we look back at the further leftists um, uh, and the right-wing thinkers during the Germany in the 1920s, they're all referring to Max Weber too. So he's a kind of nodal point, Max Weber. It's not just Max Weber the person, it's Max Weber the idea of the, the liberal sociologist, right? Or what Michel Foucault will later call the author function. It's not just the it's not just the person of the being of the author. It's what all of their works have sort of come to mean. Uh, so Schmidt had no love for sociology and note that both Schmidt and Horkheimer have invoked Max Weber, which attests to the influence of Weber's thought at the time and why critical theorists today in 2024, Wendy Brown and Samuel Moyne have both returned to Weber to understand the current nihilistic conditions, or at least Moyne, Moyne, has, Moyne just did a little critique of, of uh, Wendy Brown's stuff. So I wanted to include him here. Horkheimer says, quote, <clears throat> 
as a matter of fact, the fruitfulness of newly discovered factual connections for the renewal of existent knowledge and the application of such knowledge to the facts do not derive purely from logical or methodological sources, but can rather be understood only in the context of real social processes. When a discovery occasions the restructuring of current ideas, this is not due exclusively to logical considerations or more particularly to the contradiction between the discovery and the particular elements in current views. If this were the only if this were the only issue, one could always um, think up further hypotheses by which one could avoid changing the theory as a whole. That new views, in fact, win out is due to concrete historical circumstances, even if the scientist himself may be determined to change his views only by imminent motives. Modern theoreticians of knowledge do not deny the importance of historical circumstance, even if among the most influential non-scientific factors they assign more importance to genius and accident than to social conditions. Um, uh, you know, there's a famous later book from by Thomas Kuhn about the structure of scientific revolutions that seems kind of relevant here, but that, that comes out later in the century, and we can see Horkheimer thinking through something um, similar early on here, right? A lot of times historians will refer back and they, they might locate, locate, you know, in a biographical account of an earlier influential statesman or intellectual, um, they'll attribute some sort of causal factor to um, the, the the brilliance or the genius of that person on society. But the critical theorist um, is going to notice, as Horkheimer is saying here, that what we do as critical theorists is that we situate that individual within a whole social milieu um, and historical milieu in which they emerge. And it might seem from retrospect that this one person was like solely influential, um, but there are greater conditions to be considered. The sociological turn then among critical theorists is evident in Horkheimer's thinking in, at this point in his essay. A critical theoretical approach demands that even the notion of facts and the way facts are situated must be contextualized against or must be contextualized according to their historic situation, which I'll correct that typo here. In a strict sense, this remains true to Marxian thought because Marx himself said that historical con conditions will always and inevitably be changing. When common right-wing accusations about the nihilism of the critical theorists all, um, also charge them with just being Marxists, they have in mind um, much more of the Marxian-derived projects of the 20th century, such as the Soviet Union or later China, um, but a strict Marxian perspective cannot allow for a simple dogmatic package of what makes one a Marxist, and critical theorists such as Marcuse blatantly critiqued movements such as the Soviet Union for stopping at attempting to only provide the most, quote, rational model of society without accounting for the irrational. This is why in Marcuse's later thought, as we will see, Marcuse turns to people like Sigmund Freud, um, because... Marcus is trying to account for the irrational, where as Lenin, as practical as Lenin is and was, he's really trying to set up, according to a strict reading of Marx, according to his perspective, he's trying to set up the rational conditions of society um, by which the withering away of the state and the withering, the, 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 um, the, the more democratic moment will dissipate into the, to no longer having the necessity the necessity for even democracy itself right um it's a rationalistic account i mean you might not think that way if you you might you might think that communists are crazy or something like that but at least according to um lenin's sort of reading and packaging he, he's producing this positivistic notion of what he thinks the social conditions will bring about one of the things that the critical theorists like Marcuse and Horkheimer have been pointing out is like, first of all, something was left out of Marx, that something is missing. What, what was missing? That's the older German philosophical question. Um, at the same time, they've said that it's probably going to be something um, closer to culture, that there's something within the idea of culture or within the idea of the non-rational that is going to be need, needed to 
um, is going to, it's going to be necessary to, to account for that. And that's why there's so much in German thought. There's a lot of richness in German thought in the 1920s um, across the whole kind of spectrum. Um, uh, fascism, of course, is a movement that conditions itself on irrationality, right? I give up myself in my, in, into the flow of the movement and following the Fuhrer or something like that, whose who's own sort of like pinnacle of the of the movement gets to decide for everybody, right? There's an intentional anti-intellectualism that goes on in the populist um, um, adherence to something like fascism. It takes on speed, right? Um, the 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 flip side of that is going to be the thing that 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 slows down the speed. The thing that Carl Schmidt hates, right? <laughs> um, liberalism slows things down. Liberalism never gets anything done from Schmidt's perspective. Um, uh, uh, so that's what I think is going on with critical theorists in the 1930s and 40s is the, trying to account for the irrational. Again, as I've said in earlier lectures, that's going to take Marcuse in, into dialogue with Freudian thought. For the Frankfurt School in general, they came to believe Marx had not been able to account for the role the culture plays in domination. Thus, sometimes scholars refer to the Frankfurt School as cultural Marxists. We did some reading of Lenin's State and Revolution last week, so my hope is that you are following these, if you're following these lectures, you can see some important nuances here. Referring to Horkheimer's essay, Horkheimer is saying that traditional theory does not take account, um, that traditional theory doesn't take account of its situatedness within social constructions. That's the big problem with the traditional method. Traditional method is like enlightenment rationality. Things have changed in the 1920s and 30s. That's produced the necessity for this new way of thinking that they're calling critical theory. We can definitely hear echoes of Marx again here when Horkheimer says that traditional theory, quote, in, in traditional theory, quote, the real social function of science is not made manifest. It speaks not of what theory means for human life, but only what it means in the isolated sphere in which, for historical reasons, it comes into existence. Yet as a matter of fact, the life of society is the result of all the work done in various sectors of production. Remember that Marx and Engels in the manifesto remarked on the untruth of bourgeois capitalism in which individual owners claim that the efforts produced by countless work that they can own, um, uh, uh, that that they can that they can own what really is the material production um, produced by the efforts of countless countless workers. Sorry, that my sentence was a little bit messed up there. Um, uh, just fix that. Horkheimer is making a similar comparison to Marx and Engels when he says that for traditional theorists, um, uh, they believe that they are acting according to personal determinations, individual genius, something like that. Whereas in fact, even in their most complicated calculations, um, they but simplify the working of an incalculable social mechanism. So you can see that's where the Marxism is kind of showing up in Horkheimer, which is a really different way than it shows up in someone like Lenin, right? Um, it has a lot more to do with Marx's and Engels' um, uh, historic, historical theory, right? Which of course goes back to Hegel as we've seen, said, seen earlier. So Horkheimer then goes on to stress the common, the social formation of facts. Traditional theory, of course, sees facts as what Aristotle called inartistic proofs. I'm a rhetorician by training. I'm always referring back to Aristotle. <laughs> um, uh, it is either raining outside or it's not, as I type this lecture. And I can verify my answer by stepping outside. Yet Aristotle also conceptualized um, inartistic, or sorry, um, and so also conceptualize artistic proofs. So an artistic proof requires um, 
uh, some sort of assemblage of understanding in order to be granted the status of fact. If I give you the syllogism, all whales are mammals, uh, or sorry, all mammals have live births, whales have live births, and therefore whales are mammals. Or if I just say the, the truncated version of that, right? Um, the enthymeme, that's the technical term in rhetoric. If I just say whales or mammals, if I don't know what the definition of a mammal is, um, then I don't know how to judge that particular kind of statement, right? So I need the unpacking of the full syllogism in order to understand and verify whether or not that um, fact of mammalness is something that I can go with, right? Most of the time in rhetoric, what we do is we we we, we would don't unpack every single sentence premise by premise. Um, we will just say something like whales or mammals, and we assume that our audience members get it, right? And that audience identification moment in rhetorical theory is um, uh, shows us um, that we have pathos, right? Not pathos in the sense of like emotional appeal, like you might've learned in high school, but pathos in the sense of that the good rhetorician that knows um, how to speak to an audience and know, understands the concerns of the audience. And if I say whales or mammals, then I can assume, and I'm assuming that you know what a mam the sort of scientific definition of a mammal is. Um, but that's a different kind of fact, right? Like, like it's something that we have to come into knowledge of in order to understand it. Um, uh, so Aristotle conceptualized artistic proofs, which require some assemblage of understanding. Um, another way of thinking this, the example I have here in the text is um, that we might regard Darwin's theory of natural selection in this way. And I might, rem I, I remember as my, my human evolution in, course um, in my undergraduate, my professor emphatically was declaring to us that ev evolution is not just a theory. It is a fact. And she was just so irritated, I think, in the late 90s, whenever I took that course, she was she, she was she was basically saying to her students, in my course, we are not going to be debating in some sort of religious way the validity of Darwin or something like that. And 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 somebody saying, like, well, it's just a theory. No, my professor would say this, that evolutionary theory is a fact. But in order to understand evolutionary theory or Darwin's theory of natural selection, which is a better way of talking about it, um, Aristotle would say, yeah, that is like, that is an artistic proof. Like you need a lot of unpacking to understand um, how how biology works um, how temporality works, how economic, or not economic, climactic conditions, whatever that goes into thinking about the long duration um, uh, in which we can conceive something like evolution, right? Or not through natural selection, which is the kind of mechanism. So um, coming back to Horkheimer then, Horkheimer says the facts which our senses are present to us are socially performed in two ways through the historical character of the object perceived and through the historical character of the perceiving organ. Both are not simply natural. They are shaped by human activity, and yet the individual perceives himself as receptive and passive in the act of perception. Horkheimer comes strikingly close here to phenomenology. Remember that Schmidt like, had a little brief mention of phenomenology too um, a few weeks ago. Uh, um, and both of them are thinking of this uh, thinker who doesn't get talked a lot about a lot these days, um, a French thinker named um, uh, Henri Bergson, um, and who was uh, probably the one of the, the probably one of the most influential philosophers of the early twentieth century. Um, so uh, I think both uh, Schmidt nodded to phenomenology and to Henri Bergson, and of course we ought to note that. Martin Heidegger's existential phenomenology was percolating in the same atmosphere of Schmidt and the early Frankfurt School. Many of the Frankfurt School thinkers um, are students. So Heidegger and phenomenology more generally are important to critical theory as a discourse because, as I will argue, many of the critical theorists will be implicitly arguing against Heidegger's thought. Heidegger um, had a direct relationship with Har Herbert Marcuse and Hannah Arendt. Although not a critical theorist of the Frankfurt School, we will be reading 
Um, next, another student of Heidegger's, the Jew Jewish ethical philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, um, to get an angle on the rise of Hitlerism. What's important to note for this introduction to critical theory class right now is with, with or with, with respect to Horkheimer, is that there's a critique of individualism going on, which is implicitly both a critique of what Marx calls bourgeois society and what Schmidt saw as liberalism and scientism. Um, yeah, I could say a lot more about about Heidegger and and um, uh, um, some of that maybe will come out in the the Levinas talk next week. Um, so, uh, um, another because Heidegger, I should say that because Heidegger, like Schmidt, becomes a full fledged member of the Nazi Party, an apologetic Nazi, um, the generation of students that are both taught by him have to wrestle with um uh the way that their existence because most of them are jewish so like the that it, his thinking embraces the annihilation of their very existence and yet they are indebted intellectually to him at the same time so it becomes a really difficult thing that the thinkers are having to work out and it's very real for them this is something i say in my book um uh, uh um, enchanted citizens on transatlantic political theology that when these thinkers come over i think and they influence a lot of 1960s um uh younger students um i like i think one of the big changes that the the things is, is that, like I, I really believe that for the frankfurt school and these jewish thinkers their lives are on the line with their thinking. They're not like the Abby Hoffmans. I mean, as I mean, I have like a little, <laughs> I have a soft spot for Abby Hoffman or 60s psychedelic culture or something like that. But for most of the students of the, in the 1960s who grow up and become influenced by people like Herbert Marcuse, they are not working from the same cultural and historical background as the people who have fled Nazi Germany. And so um, we'll come back to that later on in this semester. Um, Heidegger remains important, nevertheless. Um, so both the right wing and the left are critiquing liberalism in Weimar Germany, right? They don't, it's been imposed on them. Uh, the critical theorists have come to the United States and um, uh, they continue to critique it, even though they might be a little bit softened towards liberal democracies for having allowed them in. But remember, the United States didn't let in very many Jews. Like the the the, the it is not one of the proudest moments for <laughs> for U.S. history. Um, uh, the only ones who were accepted were the ones uh, who um, had some sort of pedigree to offer. Like, and so there was a kind of prestige from European institutions that allowed um, these folks to, to actually get across the ocean in many, many cases. Um, and, and they themselves, like Hannah Arendt, will, will herself be, be critical of that very process. Um, so um, if scientism and liberalism are aligned with kind of liberal democracy, um, what uh, Schmidt calls positivism, legal positivism, right, is all going to be part of, part of that, those conditions. Um, uh, the the broader term that we could sort of package this under for the German thinkers is a critique of instrumental reason. Left-leaning critical theorists, liberal centrists like Weber and right-wing conservatives like Schmidt all lamented instrumental reason in their own way. Horkheimer says, quote, the individual sees himself as a passive and dependent, as passive and dependent, but society though made up of individuals, is an active subject, even if a non-conscious one, and to that extent, a subject only in an improper sense. He goes on and says, quote, in the bourgeois economic mode of activity of society, the activity of society is blind and concrete, that of the individual is abstract and conscious. Again, this is rational bourgeois enlightenment thought, just as Marx had critiqued it, it claims that the individual has more power than it, the individual actually does because it doesn't give us an account of the social life and activity in which that individual is situated. Um, Horkheimer does not deny 
that the social fabric fabric is in part produced by rationality and human planning. He's not saying let's throw rationality out the window. Um, but he does say that there's a kind of groping, and I put that in quotes intentionally here. There's a kind of groping towards the future. Um, Horkheimer says, quote, social action invo always involves, in addition to its inherent rationality, available knowledge and its application. The perceived fact is therefore co-determined by human ideas and concepts, even before its conscious theoretical elaboration um, by the knowing individual. Kind of like this idea that like, like as thinkers, you know, like these, you're trying to solve a thought problem, like that, that you've got to the end of the day and, and you, your mind is worn out, you fall asleep and you dream or you wake up with the answer or something like that. The answer is already percolating in there because the facts and the conditions are constellating themselves and being formed, right? So there's something like, there's a kind of pregnancy, if you will, for the metaphor of like, uh, uh, that that is that we're enduring before the con con concept is given birth. Um, and so there is a way to look at things historically, like the history of technology or the history of science is sort of building on itself and building out of itself of earlier conditions that Horkheimer says, yes, that is part of the thing. But um, uh, but what we need to look at the whole condition and the tendency in, in bourgeois society is to um, say like, oh, you individual genus, patent pending, you got that. Like you're now going to make money for your the, into, the intellectual property of your idea, right? That's going to make you money. And then you're going to be, you know, the, you, you can situate yourself higher than other people in society. So this theme is a kind of, of a kind of pregnant futurity echoes the vitalism in the thought of the French philosopher Henry Bergson. Again, he's hovering around these thinkers, but he's not, he's only mentioned briefly. Um, he's perhaps one of the most influential thinker philosophers of the early 20th century. Um, it's also hovered that this kind of same idea hovers around Mar Martin Heidegger's thought in his famous essay, although it's a bit later than this time period, the question concerning technology which also deals with the theme of instrumental reason. Recall, however, for the moment that when we read Schmidt, he called something like the blind, the, the, he called this like something like the blind leading the blind, which is why I chose the word groping above. What, what Schmidt is lamenting, he's like, he hates scientism and inst instrumental reason. Um, he hates the idea of progress. He says, we can't we shouldn't run society on the basis of progress because then we're just kind of like groping for the, the next new thing, the next good thing that might, and it, it, it might emerge eventually, but it's unformulated to begin with. Why would we want to formulate a basis of society on the next new thing that's emerging um, as opposed to the stable conditions of earlier times, like the sovereign, right? That's the right-wing critique of scientism and instrumental rationality and capitalism, right? Because capital is always about the new thing coming in. Um, so uh, um, building on Darwin, <laughs> so if we think about like, like this in a broader milieu than just the Frankfurt School or Schmidt or Heidegger or whoever, um, Bergson, building, building on Darwinian theory in the late 19th century, Bergson had an idea of creative evolution that he developed um, in a book that's also the same title. It's called Creative Evolution. Um, it proposed an orthogenesis account or orthogenetic, I guess, account um, that linked biological evolution to human creativity, implying a kind of progressivism. This is like not, this is considered scientifically bunk now, which is probably one of the reasons why we don't read a lot of Bergson, but it was really an important going theory at the time. It's like, like do, does human culture evolve in the same sense that human biology evolves, and if so, how can we track that? Right. Of course, Thomas Malthus and and social Darwinism is is um, uh, around during this time as well. Without del delving into an in depth analysis here, one can read um, with Bergson here as an attempt to quote scientifically unify the human creative capacity to the species development. And of course, you know, hovering behind this is eugenics movements, right? Which the Nazis don't invent. It's a broader <laughs> broader context. In fact, they take a lot from the United States. The eugenics movement, right, um, is, is attempting to do this kind of stuff. 
Um, so while certainly not Marxist, Bergson's thought shared the one trait of viewing a purpose to historical and causal events, the implication that a focused analysis could then allow us to prognosticate a future um, in its gestational period. Of course, as the Frankfurt School theorists like Horkheimer were realizing, traditional Marxism had not been able to account for cultural changes and the rise of technology such as mass media or for dominating populations. As he says, quote, the so-called purity of object, the objective event um, to be achieved by the experimental procedure is, of course, obviously connected with technological conditions and the connection of these in turn with the material processes of production, um, um, which are evident. Like, yes, like, like we might see an event and we might like, like claim that we can see it in its objectivity, but there's a whole process behind it, right? Again, I think that this is another aspect of German philosophical thinking that that tends to want to see everything in the process of its unfolding. Yeah, like it's in its biggest condition, like like Hegel is probably the big, the 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 big thinker of the process, right? Um, uh, works all the way into systematic theology today. If we're in religious studies, um, and of course, yeah, earlier philosophers aristotle the acorn and the oak you know like is the what is it what is in what's the information that's in that little seed that knows that it can grow into a whole piece of corn right that's where this kind of thinking is 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 rooted perhaps um uh um and 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 that's what i think horkheimer wants to give us an account for even in technological conditions and when we look at the technological technological conditions. We think it's not just one inventor who came up with this one particular invention, but there was a whole bunch of information behind that person that allowed that person to sort of uh, stand on the knowledge that had been developed beforehand. Horkheimer, at this point in his essay, turns to Kant, classic Enlightenment philosopher, right? Noting that transcendental subjectivity in Western philosophy lies at the heart of any discrepancy discrepancy between theory and fact. In other words, it takes a unifying human consciousness to do the rational synthesizing of connecting a fact to a theory of the A perception that brings about the gestalt. A perception, right? The idea that if I look at something or a pattern of something and something larger than the parts emerges, right? That's what A perception is. That's our mind's ability to see something wholly together. And it takes the subject in order, the subject looking at it in order to constellate those facts into the shape of a whole. And so Horkheimer is saying that Kant already kind of notices this, even in his rationalistic philosophy. But there is an illusion also simultaneously produced at the social level because the spiritual or mental quality makes it makes it seem like a collective spirit determines the reality of, as a sum total of spiritual factors. And this might sound really hard to think about, but like, well, uh, it might sound idealist, like in Hegelian, like spirit. Um, remember that the, that German word for spirit um, sometimes gets translated as mind. So sometimes you get Hegel's, you see his books and it's like some, like the philosophy of mind, or sometimes it's the pheno or phenomenology of mind or phenomenology of spirit. Um, Horkheimer notes that Kant saw this as, as a problem within rationality, his own account of rationality itself, and perhaps that hi this highlights why the providential element in Hegel seemed so appealing. Um, and so, like, let me just say a little bit more about this. Like, um, uh, um, if we take Kant really seriously, Kant was saying that we can't really access the external world what we only are doing based and like from Descartes on what we have is our brain's ability to rationalize and to um, make ideas out of things that might have a real world correspondence, but we never get actual access to the real world. We are kind of locked inside of our minds and our minds work in terms of rationality itself. But because they only work in terms of rationality itself, there's um, our minds, like there, there's a kind of flip side to thinking about that whole thing, right? Um, where it's, yes, it's a, 
uh, it's an apparatus of capture, but we are also captured in it, right? Um, as opposed to God in Kant's view, which is God is the world unfolding outside. Um, uh, or in Descartes, God is infinity and Descartes is finite. Finite cannot know infinity um, by its very definition, right? And so uh, um, one of the things that it seem, seems like Hegel gives us um, at the time uh, is is he gives us a reason for why rationality should exist. And the reason why he gives it is that that rationality is moving through time and evolving and developing that kind of progressive notion in Western philosophy. So um, Kant's claim, this is this is a long quote that I should probably have in blocks. Um, let me just see where, where it kind of ends here. Um, Kant's claim that tran the transcendental spirit's reality is sunk into obscurity, that is, that it is irrational despite all its rationality, is not without its kernel of truth. This is Horkheimer talking. The bourgeois type of economy, despite all the ingenuity and the competing individuals within it, is not governed by any plan. It is not consciously directed to a general goal, the life of society as a whole proceeds from this economy only at the cost of excessive friction in a stunted form and almost, as it were, accidentally. The internal difficulties uh, in the supreme concepts of Kantian philosophy, especially the ego of transcendental subjectivity, pure or original aperception, and the consciousness in itself show the depth and honesty of his thinking. The two-sidedness of these Kantian concepts, that is, their supreme unity and purposefulness on the one hand, and their obscurity or unknownness and impenetrability on the other hand, reflect exactly the contradiction-filled form of human activity in the modern period. And this is like a wonderful moment, I think, in Horkheimer, where Horkheimer is, you know, giving due credit to the enlightenment thinkers like Kant. Like Kant has some stuff, he figured some stuff out, but 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 what he actually characterized uh, for us are the self-contradictions of this transcendental ego subject that has been su such a part of Western philosophy, European philosophy, and that also is um, corresponding in some way to the development of the economic conditions that say that the bourgeois rational individual is the most civilized person and the most um, naturally able to control and dominate other peoples in the world. Um, so colonialism in here. Um, uh, uh, um, at the same time is, is, is trapped within its own self. Um, uh uh so so he's he, you know he i mean hey the sort of kant is really hard to understand um on a good day but uh i think that horkheimer is, is saying like like yeah like it, it it's it's in kant the contradictions are in kant and kant himself sees it right um uh uh and 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 at least is intellectually honest enough to point it out for us, but other people will take Kant or take that whole like, concept of rationality and run with it and put it into political forms. And um, uh, um, those forms will become uh, totalitarian forms later on, right? It will become instrumentalized reason. Um, it will become bourgeois ideology of the genius. Um, the result of the collected actions of rational and modern men is alienation from those results as illustrated by a wastefulness of natural resources and world wars instrumental reason which is beyond human control so when we aren't attentive to the inherent contradictions when we aren't giving an account of the irrational what we see is this instru instrumentalized version of rationality that left to its own devices erupts in the in, into empire into the world wars and the mass destruction that they have seen in the early part of the 20th century. Now, remember, like, so that's the, the critical theorist view, right? Remember, the Schmidian view of this is a similar critique, 
um, that he sees within liberal democracy a kind of purposeless. There's nothing at the center driving it. There's no sovereign. There's an empty chair. Um, uh, Beckett's Endgame, if you read Samuel Beckett, that's the brilliant account of this the, the 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 sovereign who's faded away or fading away or is no longer uh, um, apparent. Ubu wa, right? And Alfred Jerry, um, French idea, fr French thinker, playwright in the early 20th century. These concepts are around in European culture, the empty seat at the heart of liberalism. It's just that Carl Schmitt wants to put somebody on that seat and say that this is the sovereign. And um, Horkheimer is wants to say that he has, he doesn't want to have the nostalgia for the sovereign, but he wants to to point out that like when left to its own instrumentalization, human rationality produces the conditions for totalitarianism. It produces massive wars, massive devastation. It exploits the environment. You name it. Um, and so what becomes necessary is this thing he's going to call the critical attitude. So a critical attitude becomes necessary to confront this condition by rejecting the status quo despair of the condition, right? So it's like one thing to be at the end of World War I and like we're, we're in feeling nihilistic and we're feeling like we don't know what to do. We're feeling completely exhausted. We don't know like, like, like what's left for humanity. Maybe the same thing after World War II, of course, that there are these, the, the trauma produces these conditions of, of, of despair, right? Um, critical theory comes in as a site of intervention there. Um, critical theorists must find a way not to simply shrug off or throw their ha our hands up in the air like we're all doomed, we're just fucked, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, I can see why people do that sort of thing, but the critical theorist returns and keeps trying to figure something out. And in that sense, I don't believe that, um, as some right-wing char thinkers characterize um, critical theory, um, I don't believe that critical theory is just nihilism. <laughs> I believe that they think that they have a project, they have something to offer. Um, and I wouldn't be delving into all of these lectures and all of this reading if I didn't think that it had something to offer to you. If it were just about bitching or tearing things down, that is not exactly what they mean by negation and being critical at all. Um, so instead of throwing our hands up in the air, quote, Horkheimer says, the critical attitude of which we are speaking is wholly distrustful of the rules of conduct with which society as presently constituted provides each of its members. The separation between the individual and society in virtue of which the individual accepts as natural the limits prescribed for his activity is relativized in critical theory. The latter considers the overall framework critical theory considers the overall framework, which is conditioned by the blind interaction of individuals, individual activities, that is the existent division of labor and the class distinctions um, to be a function which originates in human action and therefore is a possible object of planful decision and rational determination of goals. Yes, we are going to analyze things at the social level, but we are going to see society as the product of human endeavors. And if it is the product of human endeavors, then under the right conditions, it can change. Yes, there's rationality in it. Yes, there's causality in it. But if we can get our fingers on the pulse of it, we can anticipate where destruction might happen and we might be able to intervene and make things better. So of course, this is fundamentally, this fundamentally requires a social analysis rather than a retreat into ideologies of the individual rational agent. We're not gonna have meritocratic ideologies of just, oh, you know, the way you're successful is you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that kind of stuff. That's bourgeois guild <laughs> um, ideology from an earlier, era. It was liberatory. It was an emancipatory way of thinking, like going out on your own as an individual and starting your own company or all of those sorts of things, like that entrepreneurship um, type of mentality. There was a time when that was emancipatory. It is just not that time anymore, is what they're saying, right? Um, we're in a newer moment of history. 
the conditions of the 20th century as they have as they have seen it require more than that ideology um more than an individual rational agent so that said in saying that we need more than an individual rational rational agent we're not just affirming as critical theorists we're not just saying that that we're going to succumb to irrationalism because irrationalism is a kind of succumbing to mass movements like fascism and the nazis that seek to channel the rage and anxiety of modern society like the will to power in nazism to use nietzsche's term um uh is uh um channeled by the fuhrer it's channeled by the nazi party members right as a way to capture people at the level of the emotion, the unconscious, at the level of their anxiety and force them into the submission of their will and to treat that submission as if that submission is liberation itself, right? So there's a kind of quasi-religiosity to that kind of um, totalitarian um, uh, Fuhrer type of, of uh, leader, right? Um, uh, uh, not and and also like that's a phenomenon I've already mentioned that that occurs in Stalinist Russia or like the mummification of Lenin. This is weird things that that uh, these societies do, and I think critical theory is not trying to critical theory is trying to 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 do something different um, uh, than than Soviet socialism for sure, and of course different from um, national socialism in Germany and not exactly the same thing that's happening in the liberal democracy of the United States at the time. So critical theory demands a rejection of status quo passivity combined with social analysis, including economic analysis premised by a materialist understanding of history that is capable of pointing out where ideology masks as reality. This is what critical theory does. If you're taking this course, <laughs> This is an important moment, right? Because this is, we are saying what it is. <laughs> um, there are methods to it. There's a reason why we have the methods that we use as critical theorists. Horkheimer further qualifies the concept of history, however. He says previous history thus cannot really be understood. Only individuals um, are in specific groups in history are intelligible. And even these, not totally, since their internal dependence on a, an inhuman society means that even in their conscious, conscious action, such individuals and groups are still, in good measure, um, mechanical functions. The identification, then, of men of critical mind with their society is marked by tension, and the tension characterizes all of their concepts of their critical way of thinking. Um, so it's not like that we don't do history, like we discount the, any attempt to do history just because we can't really access the conditions of what it was like to live at that particular time. That's not what Horkheimer is saying. Um, but we have to have a kind of flexibility as critical thinkers. Yes, we, we, we can't only construct this scientific, um, causal relationship of history by which we predict the, the the next outcome of things. Um, uh, um, uh, we also have to think about human sociality at the time. We're never going to be able to get access to it, but that doesn't mean it's not worth looking at. Um, the identification then of men with the critical mind and with their society is marked by the attention, and the tension characterizes all of the concepts of critical thinking. Tension, right? I'm not going to go one way not going to go the other way. I'm going to hold space for things that might be able to change that moment of change. Um, I'm going to hold space for the fact that I won't be able, even as, as hard as I work to try and understand the past, I'm never going to be able to really understand what it's like to be living in the past, especially the distant past, but I can piece some sort of picture together never going to know exactly the future, but if I hold the, all of this stuff in tension and I have enough flexibility in my mind and my thinking, then I'm going to come to the right decision of something to do. 
almost kind of sounds like Aristotelian virtue ethics or something. But Aristotle's been on my mind because I've been teaching him in another class this week. Um, uh, uh, but there is that that's what critical theory is. It's 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 not like just saying like it's not a rejection attitude. It's not just like, oh, I'm reading with a suspicious eye or something. No, there's it's 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 a holding space. Um, I will characterize this as an ethical move to hold space for possibility, um, to not close everything down, to remain a kind of a kind of openness, but also to be thoroughly engaged with history, both at the individual and, and the collective um, angle, or, or the collective level, I suppose. Traditional theory is different than this. Traditional theory saw the genesis and collection of facts as objective and the critical application of them in a rational system, and rational systems were taken to be external to theoretical thinking. This resulted in polarities between knowledge and action and a false sense of objectivity. In contrast, Horkheimer says, quote, for men of the critical mind, the facts as they emerge from the work of society are not extrinsic in the same degree as they are for the savant or the learned person or for members of other professions who all think like little savants, end quote. These people see themselves as fulfilling technical and specialized roles in their profession and see that as a separate as separate from social and political life. Horkheimer goes on. He says, quote, critical thinking, on the contrary, is motivated today in 1937 when he's writing this. Critical theory is motivated today by the effort to really transcend the tension and to abolish the opposition between the individual's purposefulness, spontaneity, and rationality, and those work process relationships on which the society is built. Critical thought has a concept of man in conflict with himself until this opposition is removed. So this is going to lead Horkheimer into a discussion of imagination as he continues to describe what critical thinking is. He says, quote, critical thinking is the function neither of the isolated individual nor of a sum total of individuals. Its subject is rather a definite individual in his real relation to other individuals and groups in his conflict with a particular class, and finally, in the resultant web of relationships with the society or the social totality and with nature. End quote. This definite individual must, on the one hand, reject pure utopianism while maintaining an imaginative capacity to being open to the ways that concrete conditions can change. Thinking cannot be detached or disinterested activity of the bourgeois intellectual, but rather the critical reflection of the one trying to see their self within and constituted by society, by history, etc., especially a society that appears to be constantly geared toward the alienating individuals of individuals from their social life and so on. Uh, on the one on the one hand, so which is he would say is it's kind of kind of bourgeois liberalism, right? So on the one hand, we really need critical theory for a society that tells us that um, uh, uh, that society is geared towards alienating us as individuals. That's what you would say is liberal bourgeois liberalism. On the other hand, we need critical thinking and critical theory to push away from uh, the impulse steering people toward active unreflecting and philistinism, anti-intellectualism, contempt for intellectual thought altogether, which is fascism and Nazism. That's what cr critical theory is in the way that Horkheimer imagines the project to be the thinking work that situates between those two poles. And that's why I don't want to just like, like it, it does come from Marx for sure. There's a lot of Marxian elements in it, but it is not exactly the same thing as Marxism in Lenin's sense, right? It's more about the contours of Marxian thinking, which is itself embedded with a, a longer process of um, German philosophical thinking, which is trying to give us an account for something that might have been left out of the picture. And oftentimes that account 
is something spiritual in nature. It is the idea of the numinous um, in 1920s thought. Um, so the return of kind of religiosity or spirituality or something, something that might, might have been left out that the traditionalists and the conservatives kind of want to latch on to that. Schmidt wants to say it's the sovereign. Um, he doesn't put it exactly into religious terms, but um, some people will say that that religion is what gives us this. And so there's an impulse in modernity at this moment towards traditionalism. Um, that is not part of this lecture today, but that is a that will be a, an intellectual trajectory that informs the birth of so-called radical Islam. Um, it comes from thinkers, French thinkers like René Gounon um, in this particular time period, who see with instrumentalized reason, who see with the nihilistic conditions that Nietzsche had pointed out in the late 19th century, the need to return to some sort of condition. Mircea Eliade, mm -hmm the religious studies thinker, who's also a right-wing thinker, um, characterized this as, as the mo modernity's alienation from the sacred. And so he writes this famous book called, called The Sacred and the Profane. And he says that because modernity, because we've moved away from religion, we don't have anything sacred anymore, and our lives become meaningless. And with that meaninglessness comes uh, like a disregard for everything, a kind of constant depression, a dis certainly a disregard for other human life. Um, and so what becomes necessarily among the traditionalists, um, and, and, and there's a, a strains of conservatism, of course, that align this way, is the reintroduction of something like the sacred, right? Of course, not, fascism tries to do this with something like the Fuhrer, right? So, um, uh, um, but the liberals are going to want to keep pushing us in a different, in that sign, that secularized self-congratulatory condition. Um, uh, but that the problem with that for the critical theorists is that it becomes instrumental reason. So how do we find something to navigate in between all of this sort of stuff? That's what Horkheimer and critical theory tries to do. So there is a difference in the notion of experience between traditional theories, theory, theory, and critical theory. Critical theory will not rely on individual experience, nor will it rely on imaginative genius in the romantic sense. Critical theory will derive goals of human activity from historical analysis, quote, especially with the idea, the idea of a reasonable organization of society that will meet the needs of the whole community. But this analysis is imminent critique and not correctly grasped by individuals or, or the common mind. We have to have humility, in other words, as critical theorists. We're doing critique from within a society, within a system that we can't necessarily see our way out of. We can't even position ourselves completely outside of it. That's why it's called imminent critique. <laughs> um, while Marx and Engels said that the ultimate assessment of experience will be generated by the proletariat, Horkheimer updates Marx a little bit here. He says, even the situation of the proletariat in his society is no guarantee of the correct knowledge. The proletariat may indeed have the experience of meaninglessness in the form of continuing and increasing wretchedness and injustice in its own life. Yet this awareness is prevented from becoming a social force by the differentiation of social structure, which is which is still imposed on the proletariat from the above, from above, and by opposition between personal class interests, which is transcended only at very special moments. He just says only at very special moments. He doesn't say only at the time of the revolution or something. So that's an interesting kind of thing. What what are those special moments? something that we might think about, something that Walter Benjamin is going to point us to in a few weeks. Traditional theorists are set, are too passive, according to um, Horkheimer here, um, and they should rather be motivated by a critical promotive factor in the development of the masses. We can think back here again to Marx's theses on Feuerbach, as Horkheimer notes that if the, the quote, theoretician and his specific object are seen as forming a dynamic unity with the oppressed class so that his pro 
presentation of societal contradictions is not merely an expression of the concrete historical situation, but also a force within it to stimulate change, then his real function emerges. Our attention as critical theorists is on the inspiration that is going to come from the proletarian masses. We have to have an economic analysis and an, a, a social analysis in order to try and even have tabs on what is happening from the masses, from the proletarian masses. We have to have an openness to the future. We can't will the whole thing to happen. That's kind of the mistake that the Soviets make, is they think that they can will or catalyze themselves into the society that's going to produce communism. And it doesn't work, right? We know now in the 21st century, it, doesn't, it didn't work. Um, the critical theorist cannot have the hubris of saying that, like, now let's go, we're going to go maneuver into things. Um, uh, we have to um, practice a kind of openness, practice a kind of maintaining of, of distance. Um, a, a, and in that maintaining of distance, there's a resistance to merging into the accelerationism that would become fascism, right? Um, the critical theorists then must employ an obstinate imagination, one not simply mired in fantasy or utopianism, but one flexible enough to imagine the possibility of real change. A critical theory of society will begin with some abstract determinations, but will become more focused with attention to commodity exchange. This, again, is where Marx comes in, but not in the Leninist sense of Marxism. The concepts Marx uses, according to Horkheimer, such as commodity, value, and money, can function as the genera when, for example, concrete social relations are judged to be the relations of exchange, and when there is a question of commodity of character of commodity character of goods. But the theory is not satisfied, critical theory here, right? Critical theory is not satisfied to relate the concepts of reality by ways of hypotheses. The theory begins with an outline of the mechanism by which bourgeois society, after dismantling feudal relations, the guild system, and vassalage, did not immediately fall apart until the pressure of its own anarchic principle, uh, or sorry, under the pressure of its own anarchic principle, but managed to survive. The regulatory effects of exchange are brought out on which the bourgeois democracy is founded. And so part of what Horkheimer is saying here is that um, the apparatus that we are think working with as critical theorists, it, it does maintain this sort of Marxian element because Marx has given us a really good account of how bourgeois society arose and in its revolutionary potential, it did not dissolve and disseminate. Instead, it became another oppressive class, right? So that's why bourgeois society is really interesting to sort of look at. Is like 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 it does try. It does start out as a man as a, a, a pro, an effort towards emancipation, but it ends up in domination of other groups. So. As again, Marx remains important for the not simply for the things he and Engels said in the manifesto, but because he gives us the language and the conceptual tools for economic analysis of commodity exchange under capitalism. Critical theory will build on the foundations in political economy and show, quote, how an exchange economy, given the conditions of men, which of course changes under the very influence of such an economy, must necessarily lead to the heightening of those tensions, which in the present historical era lead to, to lead in uh, turn to wars and revolutions. So critical theory is again this interventionist strategy. It is the thing that tries to see how wars in the past have come and emerged from these social conditions with the hope that if the analysis can be good enough that we can make the interventions to maybe not repeat the same sort of problems in the future. Um, the initial abstractness of critical theory, says Horkheimer, is going to give way to more focused analyses. Yes, there's an abstractness to the way that the whole Marxian situation 
um, is presented to begin with, especially in Marx and, and Engels. And we're also going to have to update Marx and Engels to our times. We can't just look at the manifesto or look at Marx's writings from the 19th century. We're going to have to update it. Um, he says, uh, Horkheimer says, to put it in broad terms, the critical theory says that the basic form of, of the historically given commodity economy on which modern history rests contains in itself the internal and external tension of the modern era. Remember back to Kant, that stuff he was saying about Kant or there. It generates these tensions over and over again in an increasingly heightened form. And after a period of progress, development of human powers and emancipation of for the individual, after an enormous extension of human control over nature, it finally hinders further development and drives humanity into a new barbarism. This is what has happened with World War I. This is what instrumental reason does. It leads to exploitation of nature, alienation from nature for sure, in the Euro-Christian perspective, and um, which sees nature as this kind of separate thing, which my native colleagues don't see nature as something separate. That's something that the Euro-Christians give us. Um, Instrumental rationality is going to push us. It's, 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 it's what creates these global wars, according to um, Horkheimer's thinking here. Critical theory is going to give us the strategies to intervene in those processes. But it's not going to be just by studying individuals or by studying society. It's going to be a combination of that. It's going to be a combination of history. It's going to be a combination of historical of uh, economic analysis that le allows us to look at the material conditions um, that produce mass society. Um, uh, and then it's going to be, we're going to look at movements with within mass society in order to try and keep a pulse on where society is sort of moving. Um, it's a lot of stuff to be doing. It's complicated work to do. I'm trying to unpack all of the conditions here and the criteria like not just the criteria, but like the methodology by which we might be doing critical theory. Um, and it's and it's and and, and to, to really look at it as methodology and not just to tie it to some politicized idea of like or a politicized end of our theories. Yes, our theories will inevitably like uh um correspond in some cases to political conditions. Heidegger's philosophy really found a kind of home within Hitlerism and National Socialism. He he thought, thought that fascism was the kind of socialized expression of what he would, had been talking about as a philosopher. So yes, there there is correspondence. Um, uh, it's not that we're in an, a completely apolitical or depolitical politicized zone. No, that's something that instrumentalized reason will try and give us. It'll try and say like, you just go to work and you do your thing. And um, you're this one little cog in society and society keeps going and we, you, um, uh, everything, if it's running efficiently, everything is good. And, um, you, you not only, um, have no real say in society, but even if you wanted to have say in society, society will not let you have say because, um, it, it has already individuated you to such an extent that you are alienated from your own creativity, your own, um, voice, your own expression, your own, all of the things that liberalism tried to protect when it had this rights-bearing kind of culture has been gutted from your real existence. And um, uh, uh, so that, that, that this is this is a problem, of course, that they see. It'll show up in sociology books like The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit and, and uh, um, One Dimensional Man, the big um, sociology books from the 50s and 60s. Um, so another interesting resonance shows up in the following paragraph as, and, and this again reminds me of Henry Bergson's thought, um, comparing critical theory to certain sequences in biology. He also, Horkheimer that is, also notes um, the interdisciplinary makeup of explanation. So another thing that critical theory does, as opposed to traditional theory, is it is interdisciplinary. He says, however many valid analogies there may be between these different kinds of intellectual endeavors, because the critical theorist will, you know, I might need to learn about biology to do my 
version of critical theory. Yeah, that's fine. It's not like we've ejected all sciences, right? Out of like, we don't rely on them. It's just that we can't rely on science sciences that want to claim a kind of pure or objective reality without having an account of the subject synthesizing it, right? So he says, however many valid analogies there may be between these different intellectual endeavors, there is nonetheless a decisive difference when it comes to the relation of the subject and object, and therefore the necessity of the event being judged. The object with which the scientific specialist deals is not affected by his own theory, in traditional theory, right? Subject and object are kept strictly apart. Even if it turns out at, at a later point in time, um, the objective event is influenced by human intervention. To science, this is just another fact. But critical theory, on the other hand, maintains an awareness of the theorist's own cultural and historical positioning, which must lend a degree of tentativeness and flexibility to the theorist's thought. It's not a closed system. And that's why it's like, yes, it is theory, and it has like all of this stuff, but it's not, it's, it, it, it is not a complete package um, that corresponds to facts like that opening description that Horkheimer gave us at the very beginning of his essay. Critical theory is different. As Horkheimer is wrapping up the essay, he gets more explicit about what critical theory is with relationship or with respect to subject matter. He says, quote, critical theory does not have one doctrinal substance today, another tomorrow. The changes in it do not mean a shift to a wholly new outlook as long as the age itself does not radically change. The stability of the theory is due to the fact that amid all change in society, the basic economic structure, the class relationship in its simplest form, and therefore the idea of the suppression of these two remain identical. The decisive substantive elements in the theory are conditioned by these unchanging factors, and they themselves therefore cannot change until there has been historical change in society. It's why, I mean... I think for Horkheimer's perspective here, it's like, yeah, well, like the Marx, Marx's theory didn't exactly pan out the way Marx and Engels thought it was going to be. Certainly didn't pan out the way for Lenin. Um, but there is still um, sort of substance to the way that he has described things. Now, it might be open for debate in 2024 whether or not that's still the case. Maybe conditions have changed so much that we can't use that anymore. Maybe critical theory has a different kind of set of parameters or a different analytical description um, at our base today. That's something that contemporary critical theorists will have to argue about right here. But I'm trying to describe in this course, like in the intro course, like what it is that critical theory um, attempts to do. So, of course, going back to, to Horkheimer here, excuse me, um, Horkheimer um, uh, says that tied to this, tied to the analysis, um, the foundational analysis that, that gets critical theory going is the concept of the social class. And of course, that's Marx coming right out of Marx, right? So the concept of it, the social class is essential to the critical theorists' work in 1937, as Horkheimer writes this. It is... Uh, it's uh, a subject um, Marx pointed to, but certainly not only Marx. For all over continental and English philosophy in the 19th century, there was the in intellectual attempt to study the human, human social groups, whether they were nations, races, or classes. We would certainly throw John, we could certainly throw John Stuart Mill's liberalism, for example, into the mix. Um, or the drama, the drama of the Dreyfus affair at the end of the century. Um, Emmanuel Levinas is going to have more to say on this in his reflections on the philosophy of Hitlerism, which I will analyze in our next lecture video. But as Horkheimer ends his essay, he alludes to the notion of the right, the right which constitutes liberalism, political liberalism as a society based on the idea that we are rights-bearing individuals, right? Um, but Horkheimer says that the problem is like, like initially, of course, it's great. Like it's emancipatory, but the problem is that, um, this right as integral to earlier liberalism has become in its later phase, a kind of ideological sham that's closely shadowed and informed by the economic condition. 
the expressed values of freedom and independence become hollow and alienated. You know, people put on stickers in the back of their trucks. They hang their American flags and like, don't tread on me or libertarianism. And it's kind of raw and, and sort of like unintellectual versions, some um, as, as, as thrown out by, by uh, um, lots of uh, folks on the, uh, on on the right or that claim to be on the right um today um uh this is kind of what what the critical theorists say is like it's like you're you're, you're repeating over and over freedom freedom like oh um <laughs> uh, independence leave me alone that kind of stuff and it's like that's never what initially li what liberalism was when it developed rights to begin with um it's certainly a, a a hollowed out version of of freedom that Levinas is going to critique in in our next reading. Um, but people send, still overtly call for it and call for it desperately um, as a value that they want to have. But the more desperately they're calling for it, like what they're also signaling is that we actually don't have it, right? And the reason why we don't have it is, 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 is it has a lot more to do with just like, you know, storming the Capitol on January 6th or something like that, right? Or shutting down the government, like, or stop the steal or whatever the current, like, uh, political slogans are. Like, the critical theorist is going to say, no, there's a lot more. Like, they will agree that our freedom is being, is taken away. There will, the, 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 but... Uh, um, the means of analyzing what to do next, we're, they're going to have different things to say. And and one of the big differences is that in order to do that, we have to analyze things at the social level. We can't only see people as atomized um, automatons as or individuals um, in that particular sense. So um, Horkheimer ends here, um, he says, under the conditions of monopolistic capitalism, however, even such a relative independence is a thing of the past. The individual no longer has any ideas of his own. The content of mass belief, in which no one really believes, is an immediate product of the ruling economic and political bureaucracies and its disciples to secretly follow their own atomistic and therefore untrue interests as they um, they act as mere functions of the economic machine, end quote. So again, as Horkheimer was writing this, the economic theory that we now know of as neoliberalism was just beginning to be developed by thinkers like Friedrich Hayek, who saw it as a third way between communism and fascist totalitarianism. But Horkheimer already in the late 1930s, and to its the tendency of advanced capitalism to align with the attempts to marketize all aspects of human life. So I think Horkheimer would be horrified by neoliberalism. Schmidt would be horrified by neoliberalism. Classic liberalists, liberals would be horrified by neoliberalism. Um, I would venture to say that someone like Adam Smith would be horrified by neoliberalism. Um, but that is the conditions that we live in now, right? In the past 40 years, maybe a little bit longer, um, uh, at least, in, and especially in the United States here. Um, so we will come back to analyze that in future lectures when, when we'll look at Wendy Brown on neoliberalism in a few weeks. But um, Horkheimer was already kind of seeing it. And I think that that's a cool thing to, to kind of look back and see um, what he's lamenting here in the late 1930s. While it is, well, Horkheimer, is explicit that there's no general criteria that exists to judge critical theory as a whole. Its foundations, he says, are consistent. So he says it is possible for the consciousness. This is what critical theory tries to do, right? It is possible for the consciousness of every social stratum today to be limited and corrupted by ideology, however much for its circumstances, it may be bent on the truth. Lots of people are going to claim that they have the truth, but it's going to be possible for that discussion to be manipulated and captured and turned into pure ideology and untruth. Kind of sounds like some like unpost truth society or something like that later on, right? Um, for all its insight into the individual's steps in social change and for all the agreement of its elements with the social, the sorry, with the most advanced traditional theories, the critical theory has no specific influence on its side, except for concern 
for the abolition of social injustice. At the heart of critical theory is a concern for the abolition of social injustice. This negative formulation, Horkheimer says, if we wish to express it abstractly, is the materialist content of the idealistic concept or the idealist concept of reason. It's important to emphasize the negation element there because we do talk in current terms about being proactively social justice. A lot of mainstream or mainline liberals adhere to a version of social justice. And so that's a big part of contemporary discussion um, that we won't be able to completely deal with here as I'm ending this lecture. But um, what critical theory does is it has a special concern in Horkheimer's words for the abolition of social injustice. So we're negating the oppressive conditions, right? We're analyzing the masses, we're looking at injustices, but what we're trying to eliminate is the repressive conditions, more so than we are necessarily advocating for one particular group. Um, and that might change later on in later discussions, but at least for Horkheimer and classical Frankfurt theorists, that's that's um, how he puts it. So he says, thus true theory, critical theory anyway, must be more critical than affirmative. You can't just say what how, how things should be, or I want this for this group of people, give this people more this group of people more money, give these people these rights or something like that. Um, that might be helpful in some sort of way, but we can't do rest there as critical theorists. Um, it must be more critical than affirmative because the future of humanity, at least in Horkheimer's time, and I, I would still agree with this, but in Horkheimer's time cannot rest on scientific positivism or instrumentalized rationality. But critical awareness maintains a habitude of pause, a flexible openness to possible change that is not to be confused with simple utopianism. It is not accomplished without great effort, but it cannot rely on the heroic efforts of individual geniuses. It must be an awareness that includes an ethical acknowledgement that the theorist is themselves socially and historically situated. The self-definition of science grows um, ever more abstract. This is a quote of the end quote from Horkheimer's essay, or the ending two lines. The self-definition of science grows ever more abstract, but conformism in thought and the insistence that thinking is fix a fixed vocation, a self-enclosed realm within society as a whole, betrays the very essence of thought itself. It's a particular kind of thought. It's a particular kind of habit of thought. It's not this kind of don't tread on me kind of critical, <laughs> like, like I'll think whatever I want. I'm a, I'm a free thinker, that kind of thing. It's like, it, no, there it is completely rooted in a disciplined attention to history. It's rooted in economic analysis. It's rooted in understanding where Marx or whatever earliest theorists, like what was left left out or what was missing. It's directed at the ab abolition of oppressive forces. Um, there are lots of conditions for what critical theory is and what critical thought is in this particular mode of doing things um, that is not just simply like rejecting things just to be devil's advocate or um just like taking on a skeptical attitude something like that uh, there's a lot more going on to to um um the discipline i think I, i'll call it that for right now not not an academic discipline but the habit formed discipline the virtue um discipline of uh doing critical theory thanks very much for watching i know this was a longer video and there's a lot to to, to unpack here. We're going to move on to Emmanuel Levinas in the next video. Um, have a great day, morning, evening, whenever, wherever you are. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to say goodbye.